So there's something there's something that is said, what you see is all there is. I don't know if it's true. I don't, I don't know if people agree with it. But what it means is all of us have our own unique experiences and our perspective. So I'm going to share you a perspective that I have. Uh, as your teacher, I'm sure you see it daily, but I'm going to put it into words. Uh, you certainly don't have to agree with it, but uh, the fact that we're together, I think it's better if you know uh, what it is, I think. So I don't know if you know this. I, maybe you do. I mean, I shared some things. But uh, I was drafted by the California Angels in 1995, and they sent me to um, they sent me to Boise, Idaho, at the age of 22. Okay, so I go to Boise, Idaho, at the age of 22. The way Major League Baseball works is they have different levels. So your lowest level is what they call Single A, and then it's Double A, Triple A, and then the big leagues. Okay, so they sent me. So A minus means low A. That's where I played in Boise, Idaho. Uh, and as you can see, I, I only played 36 games, and I hit 141. That's that's not good. Like you don't even have to be a baseball fan to know that that's not very good. Okay, so so at the end of the year, at the end of the year, uh, that the manager, uh, his name was Tom Kochman. He came to me and he said, "Wags, we, we love how you catch. We love how you throw. Uh, we love how you think. Uh, we don't think you're ever going to hit enough to be a big league catcher." Okay, so if, if you want to ride, if you want to ride buses for 10 years, maybe somewhere down the road, you're a backup catcher, and maybe you're a manager in our, in our organization. Uh, but if you're not interested in that, maybe, maybe you want to get on with your life, right? And, uh, and so they didn't release me. I actually walked away. After 36 games in professional baseball, I walked away. And what I wanted to share with you is I wanted to share how I felt at the end of my baseball career. I was all about being a big leaguer. Like, I mean, my entire identity was wrapped up in baseball. And since the time I was a little guy, that's all I ever saw. Like, I'm going to play big league baseball. Uh, but at the end, this is what I felt like. I felt like a guy in a tightrope, uh, full of anxiety, full of fear, uh, very much aware of how people, people were perceiving me, even if it was unfair, like maybe they weren't perceiving me, but I felt the, the weight of the world on my shoulders. Uh, so I very much felt like this. And when I walked away, I, I realized that I don't think I had a choice. Like I was so distraught, so frustrated. I mean, I would sit on the edge of my hotel bed multiple times crying. Uh, I would, I would, I mean, I, I would call my brother, like usually we would talk once a day. I would go weeks without calling him. Like I was just in a bad state. And I realized that I was very much like the zebra. I mean, I, I was getting chased and I was baseball's prey. Baseball was chewing me up and spit me out and I was in a really bad state. So um, I walked away from the game, got on with my life at 22 years old, okay? Uh, and what I realized was these three things, these three things that I did to me made me feel that way. The first is comparison. So I've told you before I have a twin brother, um, and not many people have the perspective of having a twin brother. My twin brother was absolutely a better baseball player than me. My twin brother was a first round draft pick. He played on Team USA. Uh, on every team I was with him, he was, he was the best player. He was a phenomenal athlete. And it's one thing to want to be something, right? Lots of people have dreams. Lots of people have dreams of being a big league baseball player. But it's really difficult to have that dream. Look at someone with the exact same DNA as you and go, if he can do it, why can't I do it? And uh, like it's not his, it wasn't his fault, but I did it to me. Like I created those comparisons. So I was really anxious trying to live up to the image that my brother like we had the same last name. I was trying to live up to that image. Totally demoralizing. The other thing is deadlines. Um, when I was playing, what people would say to me was, was people would say, Wags, if you hit, if you hit, you'll be in the big leagues. If you hit, you'll be in the big leagues. Most people don't realize this, but if you go and you look at professional athletes, uh, there's this age difference. So it said that in 1995, when I was 22 years old, I was 1.3 years older than the average player in that level. 
right? So not only was I failing, but time was running out, right? So, so I wasn't, I wasn't good enough. And people kept saying, Wags, if you hit, you'll be in the big leagues. If you hit, you'll be in the big leagues. That was added pressure, right? And they told me this is what you could be, but you're not, right? So those deadlines, they, they, they created a whole fear-based mentality. And the other one was outcomes. Um, look, guys, I was embarrassed. I was truly embarrassed. When I would take the field and I would get in the batter's box, I was always looking for the scoreboard because I knew somewhere they would post this. Somewhere my average would be displayed for everyone to see. And the other thing that I realized is that uh, my hometown newspaper, the Patriot News, right? I was, I was a local baseball player, right? Played at Redland. The Wagners contributed to a state championship and my brother was playing minor league baseball and I was playing minor league baseball. And I was embarrassed by that. Like I didn't want people to judge me on that, right? So I was really in a bad state and comparison deadlines, outcomes, t totally consumed. Like I said, I was crying on my hotel bed many a night. Well, then something happens uh, and, and it's probably going to happen to you. Uh, you guys are 17, 18, 16, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, eventually you're gonna have kids, maybe. Right? But if you have kids, I promise it'll change your world. And um, when I had my son in 2001, my nephew was born uh, in 2002, and uh, my single, my single goal was to make sure none of the athletes that I coached, including my son and my nephew, ever felt like the zebra. Okay, everything else that I was going to do was going to fall second in line to that. Because once you experience fear and anxiety and doubt, like it consumes you, right? So my goal, my goal was don't let them feel that way. Whatever you got to do, don't let them feel that way. So um, I wrote a book in 2012 called Green Light Hitting. And uh, it was designed, right, for that very purpose. How can I, how can I train baseball players to never experience what I experience? Because if you felt it once, you'll never want to feel it again, and you certainly don't want people that you love to feel it. So what I realized was that I and my brain existed in a fear state. And what I had to do, and what I had to convince other coaches of, was we had to put them in a love state. Right? We had to get, we had to rewire their brain that they loved the experience. Right? Because when I got in the batter's box, my heart was racing, and I hated my experience. It's ultimately why I left. If I could somehow take the athletes that I coached, and I could rewire their brain, then we could get great results. They would love their experience, and if they loved their experience, they could grow. So what's the trick? Well, if these three things are the, are the things that cause fear, then these three things are the things that cause love. Uh, run your race. Each of you, each of you is different at your core. You have a different heart, you have a different mind, you have a different body, you have different motivations, different desires, different limitations. You are going to grow at a different rate, right? Run your race means you're gonna just do your thing and all of that stuff around you happens to be noise. All those other people around you happen to be noise. Don't play the comparison game. Run your race. The other thing was no finish lines, right? The other thing was, look, I'm not expecting you to be great by Tuesday and you don't need to be great by Friday and you don't need to be great by Sunday. As long as you're committed to being great, I'll help you be great, right? No finish line, remove all those barriers. No, the deadline model is a fear-based model. And the other one which we embraced was this idea of chop wood, carry water, right? Outcomes, outcomes, outcome, outcomes can be very defeated, right? You see your 141 splashed across the board. You know your 141 is splashed across the paper. As a coach, I refuse to post st statistics. They were out there and people could find them. But chop wood, carry water means... We're gonna do we're gonna do what we have to do before we win. We're gonna do what we have to do after we win. We're gonna do what we have to do before we lose and after we lose. It's all the same. Outcomes are irrelevant. We're gonna chop wood and carry water. So that was that was what we did at Go Wags. That was what we did. And uh, the the cool thing was it, it worked and it worked in a big way. And we would often 
bludgeon people and and not only would we bludgeon them but we had fun doing it we did it with a smile and people realized there's something going on over there there's something going on with go wags and green light hitting and then people would ask me they'd say what's the secret like what is the secret and i would say are, are you interested in knowing the secret the secret is you have to applaud the swing and the miss that's the secret you have to applaud the swing and the miss so many young kids, when they swing the bat and they miss, some coach yells, keep your eye on the ball. Some coach yells, you're pulling your shoulder. Some coach yells, you're not doing this, right? What does that do? That creates a fear-based reality based on poor outcomes. And it, and it conspires to make you think you're not good enough, right? What we did is we said, whoa, 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 whoa. All you did was miss, but at least you tried. And then what happens is, your athletes get excited to show up because they know that their coaches are invested in them and developing, not in some arbitrary finish line, not in some random outcome. You're invested in them and their growth, and a swing and a miss is a part of baseball. If you applaud the swing and the miss, you will activate the love-based brain, and it changes everything. And then what happened was, what happened was, and this is when the world found out what green light hitting was all about, uh, the Redland Little League team in 2015 goes to Williamsport. And uh, everyone realized, like, what, 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 what is going on there? So uh, Go Wags was a product of myself and my brother. We invested in it. And then we recruited people to, that believed in our vision also. And there were a bunch of people that believed in our vision. Uh, Tom Piper, Mitch Kaufman, and, and others believed in our vision. And we created... Uh, probably about 15 to 20 adults that could influence these kids. And in 2015, the Little League team scored 262 runs, and you can't see it, but they gave up 13. They gave up 13 on their way to Williamsport. They outscored the competition 262 to 13. That's how, that's, that, that's, that's how crazy it was, right? And... When I tell people you applaud the swing and the miss, like it's a, it's a tough concept to, to comprehend because you want to coach a mistake. It wasn't a mistake. It was just a miss, right? And so at least they tried kind of ideal. And I believe, I believe this is the true model that every athlete, student, teacher, coach should function under. This model, right? Like you're still going to have the tightrope. You're still going to have it. You're still going to have risk. You're still going to have to walk. But my job for you and my job for my athletes was to be this. If you fall, I'll put you back up. If you fall, I'll put you back up. If you fall, I'll put you back up. No finish lines, right? No finish lines. Chop wood, carry water, do the right thing, just keep moving in that direction, right? So this, this is the model that we functioned under. And the reason, the whole reason that I wanted to share this message with you today was something Mrs. Yurick said yesterday. Big time. Mrs. Yurick said, why, why do our students still write slope like this? Why do they still write slope like this? When, for as smart as they are and as capable as they are, that, why, why don't they just write it as a fraction? And when she said that to me, I said, well, she, I mean, I said, well, I think I have an idea. Right? I think I have an idea. That was quite the backstory. What's that? That's quite the backstory. The backstory? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I but I wanted to share this with you, right? Because there's absolutely no reason why you can't comprehend that. Okay? All right. So I appreciate you listening. Now you can flip the paper over. Uh, Caleb, you're like sucker, sucker, sucker. All right. <laughs> All right, now look. What I would like to do, I would like to have some of you in the hall, right? And you've only got six problems. You've only got six.